Mm. Just mar- we're just marinating here for a second as this live stream begins. Yeah. Uh, it was supposed to rain a bunch, but it just did that last night, and now it's not. Um, All right. We got somebody to do this. <laughs> Lead us in, it. Chuck. What's going on, Clippers fans? Welcome to Season 2, Episode 64 of Clips and Dip. I am Chuck Mockler with William Updike and uh, Adam Osland, who you can follow on X at follow Adam A. <laughs> um, we are coming at you live over on YouTube. We're also going to have this um, as an audio format. So thank you to everyone hanging out on the stream. And thank you to everyone who's going to be listening to this later. One thing I wanted to point out, just quick, if you watch the show on YouTube and you maybe want to hear us do quick recaps after games, we do those with Adam on the radio and then we put them out. Uh, as audio. So if you've been missing some of that content, feel free to listen to it. What's up to people in the chat? We're going to talk about a lot of good stuff today. The Clippers might be starting to turn a corner. We got some pack div talk, which I know Adam and Will are really excited about. And then there's been a bunch of scuttlebutt about Paul George's contract. So we're going to get into all that. But first, Adam, Will, how are you fellas doing after the Clippers rattle off two gritty wins? It took a lot of guts. (laughs) <laughs> which is like some, which which is something that we just haven't seen from this team in a while. I, I feel like the the most disappointing thing has been the way they've sort of crumpled in the face of adversity. Uh, and I think this one, um, both in that Sixers game, which Adam and I talked a, a, a little bit about, how it looked like it was going to be more of the same, uh, and they were able to turn it around. And then in that Orlando win, I mean, that was like that was a hard fought road win. Ugly I thought, game. But, you know, yeah. like going back and forth, um, not an easy win. I got to give a ton of credit to Coach Lou. He called oh. him out for being soft. We said that was the best part of that game against the Pacers, what he said post game about the team. He, uh, I don't know. I, I, I think when you're that self effacing, sometimes when you have a realization like that, when you just confront the truth and tell the truth, and that is something Coach Lou has talked about forever. That's why guys like playing for him. He tells them the truth, he's not going to double speak. Uh, and that, to me, I don't know. When you see two gritty victories after that, there's got to be a connection there. They were called out. They were challenged by their head coach. And I think that has a lot to do with what we've seen in the fourth quarter the last two two games. Does this yeah. give anybody like some reassurance? Because I, I think there was some concern, not necessarily here, but in the general Clippers sphere, that maybe Ty Lue was losing a little bit of a, a handle on the locker room. Do you, do you guys feel... Do you guys feel any uh, reassured in that, or was that something you were never really worried about in the, in the first place? I was worried about it because when the two star when two star players are saying something and then the coach is saying different, it always feels like there's maybe some friction there. Um, but I am relieved of those feelings strictly because there was a clip from practice of Ty Lu making a half court shot and people cheering and having a good time. And that to me, I was like, Oh, we're good now. Like, I think, (laughs) like, I think, well, and I also like what Adam said, Ty Lue will talk to you about what's going on. Like, it's not going to, he will talk to you about what he expects and what he needs from you. Um, And this was in between the two wins. This was after, you know, the great fourth quarter we saw um, from Kawhi against Philly. It was the practice in between that. But that, you know, as like a cheesy as it is, I was like, that made me feel good. I was like, oh, yeah, they're having fun. They're on the road trip, you know, in the in the trenches on the nice plane that they're traveling in. Um, but that, Which is great because they hate playing at home. <laughs> I mean, it's same too. Um, but, no, I feel – I'm feeling better. I'm obviously not, you know, where I was at some points in the season with how good this team is playing. But I'm feeling, I'm feeling good. Better. Yeah. I think in the manner they won these last two games, they were the exact archetype for the games they were losing. And to see them come through late, Kawhi having an off night shooting wise in Philadelphia, the two and ones, the block at the end, mm-hmm. Paul George really carrying them in the first half of that fourth quarter with 11 points, the first seven minutes. And then what happened last night with both of them, again, your superstars pulling you across the finish line in a really tough environment against a young physical Orlando magic team. It's not like both teams. They played wilted either. They were going back and forth. You know, it was a well-played game down the stretch that felt like a little bit of a playoff type tune up. And that's what this team needs right now with nine games remaining. I think both of these games 
two of the best victories of the season, considering where they were at with how down things were and with how close they are to being in the postseason. Yeah, there was, I mean, th this, these last two games really proved the, the clips go as far as Kawhi Leonard's going to take them to some extent theory, because he just decided those games were over. Paul George was great in the fourth quarter too. Um, I loved, I mean, we got to talk about Adam. I feel like you got to be hyped on Zoo's last game. People are, there's been chatter in the Clippers here now about like, oh, when things are going poorly in the half court, maybe give it, maybe shoot the ball down low to big Zoo. <laughs> what a concept. <laughs> The guy was a beast yesterday. He was my player to watch going in just because of how physical and big Orlando could be. You knew they'd need a lot from Visa Zubas. I also felt like Mason Plumley was solid in his minutes. He had some bad moments against Mo Wagner, but he had some really good moments in that game too. One of his better games overall over the last month. But Visa Zubas had a couple of monster dunks in that game. It was so physical. Love seeing it from Ibiza Zubac, especially because he didn't get off to a good start in the first quarter. It was the second quarter, that second stint from him, where it seemed like early on he was getting into it with the refs. He pushed that stuff aside, and he just let his play do the talking, and he was a force. Uh, for Shizzle but Dizzle with a great comment on here. Would have liked some of this good process like 10 to 15 games ago, but better late than never. Yeah, you know, we got to... We got to take what we can get at this point. It's crunch time. <laughs> what about this, though? There's something to be said about peaking at the right time. Yeah, exactly. They're on the upswing. <laughs> um, they flipped the switch. No, they, we don't know if they fully flipped the switch yet. Um, well, I, Paul George certainly <laughs> flipped it back off or something. I don't know what's going on with yeah, that. He's toggling it. Um, what do we think is the most encouraging sign from these last two performances? Um, might be a chance to perhaps show some of these the good things from these last two performances wink wink adam um, oh do we have a high five coming i up? think we have a, i was told that we maybe have a high five we can do a little high five here boys <laughs> five highlights from yesterday's game Let's in orlando it. i'm good with that and most of these highlights are also good are you guys seeing the screen correctly okay we're yep. good to go here so I this is the First possession of the game, sound is off. <laughs> Adam's least favorite thing. <laughs> By the Clippers. Hey, it's my fault. Uh, after giving up an easy bucket to Gary Harris, as James Harden just closed in on him a little too quickly, let him blow by him for a little floater. Here's the Clippers' first possession. You'll notice right away here, you got James Harden way up on the left wing. Avica Zubas comes over and sets a little off-ball screen for Kawhi Leonard on his man and Ben Carroll. Kawhi makes a little tight curl around here. James Harden finds him. Now the basket's wide open, but Gary Harris pops off of his defender in Terrence Manor, his, his um, opposition in Terrence Mann, heads towards the basket. Kawhi sees that. It's well contested enough that he goes, okay, I know I got a man open. I know we have numbers. Kicks it back out to T-Man. What I like about this is, Man looks over to Paul George, who's also open in the near side corner. You got Franz Wagner here having to make a decision, and it gets him to stop coming straight to man, and he goes towards PG just a little bit to get him off balance. And Terrence Mann, who's been shooting 45% from three in since January 1st in the new year, takes and makes that shot when he could have given it up to PG-13. And by the way, guys, uh, I don't know. I feel like those people who gave up on Terrence Mann might have been wrong about his three-point shooting. I don't know. Sure seemed like it was a good idea to keep him in the starting lineup, and eventually he was going to progress to the mean because that's exactly what we have seen, 45% from three since January 1st. We're talking about over 30 games here. What I like about that, too, is <clears throat> A, a lot of motion. I feel like sometimes we, we, we don't see a lot of motion. Moving. Uh, and they get into it early in the shot clock, which gives them a little bit more time to work. You know, it, that Terrence doesn't have to huck up that shot at the last minute. We don't have to like bail something out. Like they they got into the offense more quickly, which is something Ty Lewis said again and again. And I love the fake. I cannot <laughs> describe how psyched I was because that's confidence. That's a confident move by Terrence. That's something. Well, he I loves a fake. Someone. Well, sure. Yeah. On the other hand, yeah, he knows that people probably bite on him. Uh, but that was well. That's that then has been the issue. <laughs> yeah, that has to. That move shows confidence, which is exactly what we need from guys. Yes, he's a starter, but you know, we the the other role play guys need to feel confident. So I was really I was hyped to see that. I mentioned Big Plum. 
I felt like he had a pretty solid performance overall in limited minutes, granted. And we have a play from him and Norman Powell here after Norm got one to go in transition. Here's Mason Plumley as Westbrook comes over to set a screen on Cole Anthony, I believe it is, for uh, Norman Powell to come over here and catch a little dribble handoff from Big Plum. Plum rolls to the basket. And you know Norman Powell going right is lethal. That's what he wants. So he's going downhill in a hurry. Mo Wagner's in drop. He's got to get back. He follows him all the way there. And for as much as people say, well, Norman Powell is just a scorer. He's not that good of a playmaker. Look at this nice wraparound he has after he draws two to Big Plum, who eventually gets it to go here. like that little spin move from Mason Plumley too. But that was early second quarter. The Clippers had just won the first quarter, I think, by – what, four or two points, and they got a little bit of spark there to start the second. Yeah, uh, I like this comment by Wilbert Beltran, which we're probably going to talk about. He said they need these kind of plays. Yeah, thank you, Will. They need these kind of plays in tempo in the fourth, too many droughts in the fourth. I think they're building up to getting better at that. Like, I, I agree that the fourths have been a little rough, obviously. <laughs> I mean, recently they've been better, but they've still been – thin margins the Clippers have have gotten some of these you know good things that happen on so I'm hoping the the legs come back a little bit there too I agree with that Wilbur. speaking of rewarding your big men how about Avica Zubats here with this block the beast was unleashed he doesn't fall for the same fake that Mo Wagner just gave a little bit earlier in the quarter to Mason Plumley, which led to a blow by for an easy dunk from Mo Wagner, who almost won the game single handedly for Orlando in that fourth quarter. But now it beats the Zubots is back in. He just doesn't fall for it whatsoever. A little dribble drive, boom. Block comes up with it. It's the old Bill Russell play. Now the Clippers have some numbers. And because he blocked his man and Mo, Mo Wagner, he knows he can beat him down the court. And if you do beat him down the court, you got to reward the big man. So Paul George has it here on the left wing. It was Joe Ingles who probably should have got back. You love seeing that against the beats of Zubats here. PG 13 with a nice bounce pass. Big Zoo, the recipient defense to offense. That was all big zoo right there. I think that's one of my most encouraging things is the defense to off. How many defense to offense plays we saw yesterday. That's how the Clippers are going to have success. Yeah. Just defensively, their defense won that game. They've gotten like they've gotten back into form there, which has been missing for a long time. So it's good to see that it still is there. Just need to see some consistency. Totally. They went from being 29th, their first uh, 23 games post Grammy road trip defensively, to jumping up two spots last night. Let's go. <laughs> to uh, <laughs> ten games left. We keep going two spots. We're going to be right near that top ten pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, to 27th after holding the Orlando Magic down to just nine. Kissing points. the bottom three, but not in the bottom three. <laughs> not in the bottom three. Now here comes a negative play, boys. Instead of earmuffs, if, yeah. if you want to put blinders on, that's fair here. Russell Westbrook throws a bad pass. He was looking for Terrence, man. I don't know what's happening here uh, as the Clippers were trying to speed things up. It's taken away by Suggs. So the Clippers, this is your classic, okay, transition defense play by the Clippers. How is it going to look after a live ball turnover? Kawhi doesn't exactly get on hustle his back. dogs and hustle back <laughs> as fast as he could. Russ is smiling almost here, you can see, because he knows how bad of a pass that was. But now the Clippers are scrambling. The thing is here, it's not an advantage right now for the Orlando Magic. It's three on four because Avita Zubats wasn't even all the way down the floor yet and engaged on the offensive end. So Avita Zubats points out somebody has to pick up his man, I believe, in Wendell Carter, who's going to get back late here. But the Clippers still have the numbers. The ball's in Suggs' hands, gives it up to Franz Wagner. Terrence Mann takes him. Now here's a problem. They see Suggs. He can shoot it. Mancaro is in the corner here, and both Avica Zubats and Kawhi Leonard come towards Suggs. Meanwhile, Russ is guarding nobody, and <laughs> Suggs eventually gives it up as these two are looking at each other. Once again, miscue between Kawhi and Avica Zubats. Suggs gives it up to Mancaro because both of them left him, and he gets an easy one, a dunk of the basket, and now you see 
once again, some uh, disgruntled teammates here in Kawhi Leonard and Vita Zubots. And to be honest, I think this is probably on Kawhi Leonard because watch the Vita Zubots here. He comes up to contest this shot by Suggs. He sees what's going down, but Kawhi jumps over. Ben Caro's his man. Kawhi, I think, was trying too hard to cover up for everybody else's mistakes, but Big Zoo was all right there. He had that well enough contained. So just one of those easy buckets the Clippers have been giving up now for, well, really all season long in transition. <laughs> that I, process, though, of uh, like the process of that transition defense, they didn't end up closing it out, but it does look better than, than what we have seen. And part yeah. of that was just Zoo being in position early. But I, I mean, I agree. Unfortunate result, but at least, you know, at least it wasn't a com it, it wasn't a complete giveaway. And we've seen, I feel like we've seen Zoo and Kawhi conversating more about defensive miscues lately, which can be bad, but I think it is good. I think they're actually communicating it out. It's less yelling at each other and more yelling while conversing, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm hoping that we see that less, obviously. You can't say guys don't care when they're bickering with each other after <laughs> right? plays like that. Bad teams, totally. they just move on and act like it's business as usual. That's, That's typically what happens when you're not trying to correct easily correctable mistakes. Now we move to the biggest shot of the ball game because I wanted to end things on a high note here. And this was just so damn impressive. First, it was Kawhi Leonard, obviously. He got the switch as Orlando was switching everything. He got multiple guys off of him. First, it was Bancaro. Then it was Franz Wagner. Then he gets the easy one over Suggs, who's a good defender, but just too small against Kawhi. But now it's Paul George. What's interesting about this, Clippers are up 1, 98-97. There's 10 seconds left here. This ends up being the dagger. But Joe Ingles was subbed out for Jonathan Isaac rightfully so but Makes he's sense. there for defensive purposes you're trading offense for defense here Ingles came back in on the final possession as the inbounder but Jonathan Isaac started on Kawhi Leonard on this play but it was Paul George who came towards the basketball I believe it was James Harden the inbounder and Jonathan Isaac switched and it just goes in a straight iso mode here guys they basically clear out for him James Harden is going to come up here to the corner. And this is the type of stuff you're going to see in playoff games. Your best 100%. versus their best. 100%. Everybody wants a ton of movement. They want some X's and O's drawn up play at the end of games. But in a seven game series, most of the time, the team is well prepared and knows what's going to happen. So it, it's going to come down to ISO ball sometimes. I'm Stars. sorry. It's yeah. Have you watched many game sevens? They're typically very low scoring for a reason. Now, <laughs> this move, though, by Paul George, there's a couple of things that need to be observed here. Because, first of all, physically, we've talked about how much better he's been shooting. This game notwithstanding, he was 3 for 13 before this <laughs> shot here. But he did make three of his last four in the fourth quarter. And his defense was really good for the most part all game long. I felt like he gave a great effort on, effort on that end. But the athleticism and the move he makes here just shows you the groin, the knee, it's feeling good. Look how deep he gets into it with the shove off here on Isaac. One of, if not the best defender in the league, when healthy, he is that elite on that end. But you can see the, how spry Paul George is, the quickness, and he gives him a little bit of shoulder fake going to his left here, which I think gave him just enough separation when he comes back to the fall away going right. But my God, this is just the arc on that ball to get that up. I, there's nothing you can do about it. And that's why you have these two guys on your team. They're two of the best tough shot makers and takers in the league. And it was great to see Paul George have that confidence at the end of the game to still take this shot. He's not looking for anybody else. It's complete tunnel vision here. To have that much confidence with the game that he had, let's watch one more time. Ooh, the way he backpedals too. Like I love yeah, the Paul he George. Knew it was in. Yeah, I love the Paul George confident backpedal because it's yeah, it's going down. It's funny if you go to the beginning of this play a little bit, it almost looks like Zeus calling for the ball in the corner, which would be so funny. Watch Zeus' hands. <laughs> here we go to it here. Um here's Big Zoo. <laughs> He's not calling for the ball, but I would love it if. It Sorry, buddy. He couldn't see I you. Should, I, I don't, should get this on the base. Line. I don't know if he's communicating someone with the. I don't know if he's calling for spacing here with Harden to create hard more background. room. Yeah. This is just now as a bonus. 
I don't love what happened here at the very end. <laughs> the Clippers six? ended up getting high, high away high with it. People. It's just a quick honorable mention or dishonorable. Uh, both Paul George, or excuse me, both Kawhi Leonard and Terrence Mann, for whatever reason, chase Suggs here for a second. Kawhi yeah. recovers and eventually sees his man, Franz Wagner, is going to get the basketball up here on the left wing. But he does hesitate. They first come over to Suggs. Then he bounces back. His brother, Mo gives Kawhi Leonard a little bit of a shove, but he got back in time. He was completely off balance, and that shot really had no shot. But stuff to work on. They got Always stuff to work on. There's a lot. That's the other part is like there's a long ish way to go for the Clippers to get to championship level basketball. What do you guys want to pick as your most encouraging thing over these two games? Will, what were you most? I like what I like. I like what Wilbert uh, is saying here in the chat. PG has started the process of crashing the glass better, and it's helped our defense close out possessions much better. And I want to say the rebounding from both Kawhi and Paul George um, has been elite lately. And it's one of those things. Um, it's one of those things that makes them the best. Like, you know, the, the, some of the best in the league is that uh, th they can do dirty work as well as, as get things done on the offensive end. And seeing oh, yeah. that, seeing that like improved commitment, that's one of those things. Like in a, in a playoff series, if we have the unfortunate game where – Two out of the big three aren't connecting offensively. What can keep them in this game is what can keep them in those games is some really sound rebounding. Yeah, uh, I think that was Paul George's first 10, first double digit rebounding game of the year was yesterday, um, which is great to see. Adam, what were you most encouraged by? No, the rebound is a great point. Clippers are 5 and 0 oh when Kawhi or Paul George get 10 plus rebounds in a game, I think there's something like 8-0 when you expand that out to James Harden or also Terrence Mann getting double-digit boards in a game. So, I mean, it's been clear all season, obviously. It's been an issue for this team rebounding-wise, but these are very fixable things. It's mostly just effort. There was a rebound that Paul George got in Philadelphia, yeah. I think, in the fourth quarter. Yeah, was, oh, my God, yes. His best rebound of the year like, by a mile. That was all That should go on the muscle. highlight reel. Like, that, that totally. deserves 100%. to be on a highlight reel. I wish, yeah. I was looking for it on the NBA.com recap of that game, but they didn't include it in there. But it you're, was it was special. A strongly worded email to include more tough board <laughs> highlights. So that, uh, yeah, I think it's hard to not pick – you know, the the rebounding and the the defensive lockdown kind of in these last two games. I think individually, Paul George getting paint touches um, was really, really, really encouraging to see because he doesn't do that very often. Uh, but when he does, again, that shows confidence. That shows him knowing what he needs to do, which is muck things up. Against the Rockets, he did it too. He was putting his head down. They needed a bucket. He went straight to the paint. Like, it's, it's nice to see Paul George rounding into form too because he really helps the Clippers ceiling quite a bit. Um, yeah, I, and just the fact that they had to fight and battle in these games, Paul George early in that fourth quarter yeah. against Philly, they're down four entering the fourth. They get down five, a five Oh run by the 76ers. That is exactly what had been breaking the Clippers will the last two home games. And even going back further than that teams making a run to start fourth quarters, they get up double digits and eventually the Clippers break. Paul George came back right after that. They're down nine and hit a clutch three-pointer. Just ISOed on the right wing, put it between his legs a couple of different times, and fired it. He hit another one when they were down seven. He hit a bunch of timely shots, 11 points in the first seven minutes of that fourth quarter against Philly before Kawhi Leonard could get to that point where he has the and ones going on late. So those are kind of those silencer, those run-stopping shots that you have to have to just show that fight that we're still in this. Yes, runs are going to happen. It just seemed like they forgot about that for a period at a time this season with this Clippers team with the way they weren't responding the way yeah. and the way that Paul George kind of all season has even despite some some of his worst games been able to turn it on in the fourth is also like you know that's also pretty reassuring he's toggling the switch that's what we've been saying uh um, edging it <laughs> okay uh has the where this is this is the saturday afternoon stream not the saturday night stream so, um <laughs> uh is the fun meter before we start talking about the upcoming schedule a little bit, because they do play Charlotte tomorrow, and then there's some kind of scary 
uh, the Mavs might end up being the first round opponent again. Um, I, I, Will has the fun meter moved, or do you, are we are we un are you not as I go, I'm I'm encouraged, but I'm not back in the hopium den ordering another round. You know, yeah, it's it's not a complete 180 or anything, but it's it's trending in the right direction, and you know, it's it's just the good process, and um, it just. Obviously, wins solve any locker room problems, any issue. I mean, like if you're winning, but just the the way they've looked on the floor, uh, and and as I said earlier, facing adversity, I, I'm having a lot more fun with that. It's not fun to watch a team that feels listless. It's it's not fun to watch a team that you <laughs> know you is gonna that you know is gonna crumble. Like when the pressure is on them, uh, they just kind of fold. So it, it it's trending in the right direction. Uh, I would say. It's like it's maybe the amount of fun as like a pizza a, a pizza party that wasn't well planned at work. There's like everybody only everybody only gets one piece. There's uh, pizza, but and there's there's pizza, but it's kind of like hey guys, there's pizza in the break room. It's not like everybody is like hanging out. It's you not a block. I mean? It's not blocked out on the cow. Yeah, yeah. Adam, where's your fun? Are you are you still waiting to to, to flip the one eighty? Uh, it don't flip the 180. I don't know. Do you still? I mean, they don't look like a championship team still yet. We need them to hit a, a different gear. I I would like. To, I know they can. Um, I, I these last two victories, the way they won, those are the type of games you have a lot of the time in a playoff series. Totally, it's not pretty. The Clippers had 17 turnovers versus the Orlando Magic. They got up by 11 in that third quarter, and they just gave it away multiple times down like we have seen, and they still just figure it out eventually. Uh, as long as you're seeing, because Kawhi Leonard said post game the last two games, basically teams aren't going to lay down against us. We have to know they're going to compete hard. They're going to be trying to win too. We can't just give in because the other team has great players as well. We got to get used to this. So that's all it is, and I, I think – that's something that, you know, it's rudimentary, it's obvious, but sometimes when you lose five straight games at home and Paul George is talking about, yeah, you kind of sleepwalk into games, you basically, you're relying on the crowd to give you that energy, but on the road, they've had to figure it out immediately. They've had to start faster. They didn't in Philly, they did against the Orlando Magic, and I did say as a positive going into uh, or going out of our last show that, you know, maybe being on the road, being in the foxhole together can help this team. So I, I don't know. These are these are really important games. These are important type of victories. This Clippers team just was able to get 100 percent. Someone in the chat pointing out that their nine and seven record is pretty crazy with this March. Ten and seven is very much on the table. We're going to talk about. The Clippers upcoming schedule uh, and some packed div talk. If you're uh, listening to this, there's going to be some ads and then schedule talk uh, in three, two, one. All right. So the Clippers are rounding out uh, the, the the very last game in the, the hellacious March schedule. Uh, they still have some games left ahead of that before we can before we can finally get to the dang playoffs. Um, Charles, I, let's just start this off with. Uh, sort of the, the the March. Where are we at in March? March benchmark. We're at nine and seven, ten and seven still on the table. Given the way things looked at times on the court, were we maybe a little reactionary? Given that the, the ten and seven is still in play, what do you what do you guys think? Where are you at on this? I don't know if we were reactionary because the the way that the games were being lost was just brutal. Like it it's bad. not it's not it was, it was rough. <laughs> they weren't like losses where it was like, oh, it hit the rim three times on the last second and we we barely lost that one. They were discouraging losses. Um for sure. I don't think uh and yeah, we got down a little bit, but I think you know those were those were immediate live reaction post game pods. So what are you gonna do? Uh, but no, I think they looked rough. They looked really rough. I still, they're, I, they're trending towards 10 and seven in March. That seems very possible with who they play tomorrow. No disrespect to the Hornets, but, um, but I would love to see them absolutely, uh, just decimate the, the, the Hornets. Uh, that would be great to see fourth quarter rest for two, one, three. 
um, then I would feel pretty solid about the 10 and 7. But if they struggle, I'm going to be like, all right, we still got a lot. We got the ways to go. Adam, where are you at? Did we react too hard? I, I don't think we overreacted. Did Coach <laughs> Lou overreact when he called right. him soft? Things <laughs> yeah. were dire. They were circling the drain. <laughs> they were playing like a team that didn't want it anymore, and they were about to give up not just home court in the first round, which could still happen, but it looked like they could fall into the play-in. Uh, they've steadied the ship to some degree. They still have to win. I would say if, if you go six and three, there's a real good chance you're going to have that four seed in the last nine games. Yeah, There's a real good shot at that. But it's about process and the way you play. It's not just about wins and losses when you're trying to build good habits. A little bit, though. <laughs> no. It's well, a little bit about wins. Look, well, even sure. if the process is bad in a win, I'll take the win. You'd rather win ugly than lose pretty. I understand that. But we want to see a team that's trending the right direction, not just to win in a first round series or have home court there, but to have a chance to be a contender and make a real run at this thing. So those last two, that looks like a team that's ready for big Going, moments. Yeah. And this up and to the right. Yeah, for sure. Do we want, what do you want to see in Charlotte? Will? do you want to see just complete decimation? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see this one get put away early. I mean, the Hornets are just in a rough state as far as, like, health and availability. Um, yeah, I, I would like to see the Clippers. I would like to see the Clippers show up for this one early. You know what I mean? Like, because I, I this team has a, ten, a tendency to play to the record, not to, not to the team. So it, it'd be nice to see them um, sort of with the foot on the gas early and with the foot on the throat late. <laughs> Damn. Uh, they're also playing right after they play uh charlotte they're playing sacramento who has recently been decimated with injuries kevin herder and malik monk now just out which is a shame for them um oh lalo Contreras with a nice take her herder's done for the season right it's i think yeah. it's season and any shoulder injury yeah and then malik monk has an mcl sprain i think um was the news so that's tough for them um Lala Contreras still believes in the team. If they end up in the fourth seed, he thinks or they think that they can uh, make it to the finals, which is, you know, that's fair. Um, the schedule, so they got Charlotte, they got the Kings, and then they have a Nuggets Jazz back to back. What would a what would this is a nice path before the Nuggets game, right? You get teams where you can keep building good process, hopefully stack some wins because a win against the Nuggets this late would feel pretty damn good. Correct, Adam? That's going to be a good game. I think the most important thing pertaining to that game, obviously the Clippers need to win, but they need to win not just for themselves. They need to keep the Nuggets from getting the one seed. Oh, Therefore, yeah. you don't have to take them on in the second round if you're lucky enough to advance. That's what I'm worried about right now. And the Nuggets got run last night badly by the Minnesota Timberwolves who they see one more time. So it's very possible. They don't end up with a one seed. If you can, you can help your own cause a little bit there by taking them down. And yes, confidence wise, that would be big because that would have cool. that would mean they won the last two contests against the Denver Nuggets this season. Damn. Yeah. And I can, I literally cannot remember the last time that happened. <laughs> um, um, Will, what are you looking for kind of in this run up to the Nuggets game? It is a we have the Nuggets Jazz back to back, but it's Nuggets first, thankfully. Um, after these couple games, I mean, just more of the same getting into the offense quicker, um, really fighting on the glass for those boards, especially with how small this team is. It's time to start, it, it's time to start taking those small ball lineups and minutes really, really seriously. Uh, because we, we need to have. We need to have these rotations a little bit more ironed in, and I, I know that that it hasn't it hasn't always been easy with some of the inconsistent play from Tice and Plumley. Um, but anytime we're and going PJ. small, I, I I need to see yeah, and PJ of course. Um, I I just I need to see the same commitment on the glass as we've been seeing in these last few games because. I, I don't know. I don't know what to expect from from Plumlee or Tice in 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 a first round matchup with if if it ends up being the Pels. I you know like I I don't imagine that we'll play big with a big outside of Zubats. I I think that we'll probably opt to go small. And I think the habits that they build in those lineups right now are going to pay dividends later. 
Should have listened to Dark Knight's vibes. Should have traded for Andre Drummond, signed Boogie. I mean, it's not like Boogie. <laughs> How many good. damn centers do we need on this <laughs> roster? Five. We need five centers on the roster. It's very clear. As Boogie played in two years, I think there might be a reason that he hasn't. Yeah. He, he looked pretty done with the Clippers in 2021. Dark Knight vibes. Why so serious? Man? Unless he was matched up on um uh who was it on the Suns where Boogie was just dom- Dario? Um Sarge. <laughs> yeah, Sarge was on Boogie sometimes, and that was that was a good time. Um, yeah, the the rebounds, I think, is is what a lot of people are gonna be looking for from the two one three guys. Um, because that's effort. And Law Murray brought up a good thing on Twitter. Paint touches are effort too. Getting paint touches on offense is an effort thing, too, right? I think um a lot of the times you associate effort with just the defensive side of the ball, but getting to the paint, which Paul George has done more of, and James Harden, who did get forced into the mid-range a little bit against the Magic, and that was not going that well. Um, I'm excited to see how he looks getting downhill. Oh, my God, Scott Tran, thank you for reminding me. I don't think we've actually talked about this on the podcast yet, but they're giving away stress balls at the game against the Nuggets on April 4th, which has like Simpsons level uh, possibilities of a hilarious <laughs> giveaway. I hope things go well and those stress balls stay in the seats. But man, giving away uh, projectiles at sports games, I always think is such a bull. Uh, it's not strange but... at all, Wayne Jenkins. No team man minutes in the fourth quarter last night was strange. Guess what they did? They, they went to the Power Rangers. They're starting to go back to it all of a sudden. They realized, well, I don't know if he wanted to hide it from teams and realize there's just no way because you have to win games right now and you yeah. couldn't hold that one that close to your chest. But they're going back to Power Rangers as they should. Now, they went almost six minutes in that fourth quarter last night without <laughs> scoring a point. <laughs> That they, feels like an outlier, though, right? And that's with not the, a with team the, band with the Power thing. Rangers. Yeah, no, that's and that wasn't a, yeah. all with the Power Rangers out there. Um, but the Clippers, I think, where did they end up with fourteen points? It was a, it was still a brutal scoring fourth quarter because of that. They ended up with fifteen points in the fourth, but they held the Magic to twenty. So you were okay there, but they still, yes, they have things to work on. You can't have scoring droughts that deep in a fourth <laughs> quarter. <laughs> But they had their best when it was required from two one three. Do we think um, there's been some chatter amongst Clippers Twitter people? Do you think there's going to be a norm uh, change to the starting lineup at some time in the playoffs? Some people want that because the offense is incredible with that lineup. Um, but there's some chatter. I'm not saying I agree with it, but it is. He's very good. With he had that a lineup. defensive play in that game. I forget if it was on Bancaro. It was really out of the ordinary, like a fantastic defensive play by Norman Powell, where he just stood somebody up completely against Orlando. He's another guy that's capable. A lot of these guys have individual switches. Well, I'll say with this Clippers team where it's in them to rebound it's in some of them like Norman Powell to play much better defense. And when that time comes, when there's more of a sense of urgency and desperation because of the playoffs, I think the team has been counting on that, those switches to be flipped and they will be just like they were in game one against Phoenix last year. We've seen Norm flip some Norm's defensive reel this year. There's been some nice stuff. He he's okay at playing free safety. He can pick off an errant pass. Um, he weirdly has had some decent challenges at the rim this year when he's had to like slide over. Um, so yeah, I agree that there's a switch there. Will, do you think Norm's going to end up in the starting lineup at some point? No. Why? <laughs> People say the argument I've seen is because the, the defense for the starting lineup, uh, this was the argument I've seen. I'm not advocating for this. I'm repeating the information, um, was that the defense isn't exactly lighting the world on fire for the Clippers starting lineup. And having it's, Norm in the offense would just make the offense no, that much better. I, I, I'm, I, that's still a pass for me. It's kind of like we, we talked about this earlier in the season. Um, I think that Adam pointed out in the high five, but I think like the tendency to make Kawhi have to do too much in, in some of these like less than stellar defensive lineups isn't great. Uh, and it's the same thing with Zoo. It's the same with PG. There's only so much communication you can do. There's only so much ground you can cover. If you got two guys out of five who, you know, 
I, and Harden has Harden has flashes. You know, he like he just has his limitations as a defender. He point of attack always, totally. Like, yeah, he always will. Um, so I. I, I get the idea, and I love Norm. I want him to win six man of the year. I, I think he's good where he's at. I, I don't see a starting lineup change. You know, we just kind of talked about the rotations and stuff and what we want to see in these upcoming games, and I don't see a starting lineup change as being, like, what's <laughs> not the difference top. maker right now for the team. Not not to me personally. Yeah, I and- think people are missing the point. The reason they have Terrence Mann in the starting lineup is so Kawhi and Paul George don't have to guard the other team's best player until the fourth quarter. After Kawhi hit that shot over Suggs with 35 seconds left, he deed up Van Carroll, and they got the turnover where Bear Carroll tried, Van Carroll tried to kick it out to Suggs, and it was a no-look steal by James Harden, who wasn't looking at the play but had his hands up in case he did that, went off of him, and he ended up with the basketball. Like That's what you want to see. You can't. Asking Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, even in a playoff series, to guard the other team's best player for 40 minutes, which is how many minutes they'll be playing in a playoff series, a in a playoff game, yeah, it's not sustainable. You have to have somebody else be a really good point of attack defender. And I think Terrence Mann is good enough. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's totally fair. Um, and it matters, again, as always with the Clippers, who's closing. Um, that's what we're going to see. Sometimes it might be Norm, right? Who knows? Um, and a lot of people in the chat are bringing out the very good point that the bench gets real weird offensively if you start Norm. <laughs> There's not a lot of like long range punch. Uh, yeah, you need you need his shooting. Better. Like you 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 need his like you need his north south movement. Like I you just you need Norm on the on the second unit. <laughs> You need I, Norm. Okay. You like to have you, you like to have him with the starters, but like that's what closing lineups are for. That's what the Power Rangers are for. You know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. doesn't have to be doesn't have to start the game with that you know you it it should really be like a a a, like not necessarily a pull in case of emergencies but like a lane change or a tempo change that you can offer like it it shouldn't it shouldn't be the standard if that makes sense a hundred percent hey what about alfredo rodriguez here do you see that uh yeah uh put the lineup question on the chat will (laughs) uh could we get a westbrook harden george leonard starting lineup again with westbrook at center Man, coffee, Powell's fifth. No, we Dear can't. God. I love. Wanna... I love that you're throwing this out here, though. I do. Like, <laughs> I, I, sure. I, I appreciate the ingenuity. So, also lost in everything this year. We haven't talked about this in what feels like ages. Um, the Clippers. <laughs> the Clippers are have a pretty good shot to win the Pacific Division for the first time in ten years. Since 2013, 2014, um, they have one game versus the Kings, who are three and a half games behind them, and then two versus the Suns. Uh, they are four games behind. When are you? When are you guys getting to the parade? When I'm not sure what time. Uh, Ballmer has anything set up, but I'm hyped. We won the division. Let's go. Division play should matter more. It, it should matter, matter more. <laughs> it, it'd be I yeah whatever. I think making the division it like, matter more effing less. <laughs> I, I think making the division I shouldn't more, have them. <laughs> I think making the division more competitive to me is more interesting than the in season tournament. But yeah, who know. cares about that? Um, and then uh, Jeremy Mormon with the question: Does the playoffs really matter? Thank you, Ray. I'm sure Ricky Chu will have a banner photoshopped immediately, probably after listening to this. Um, Jeremy Mormon asking: Does the bench really matter when it comes to playoffs? Yes. Uh, it's not as guys big can't play for guys is. cannot play 48 minutes. And like, even with the staggering that we have with Kawhi and, and, and Paul George and Harden, you still want two of those three on the floor at all times. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't know. It not, it matters is what I'm saying. I, I'm not saying I don't know. <laughs> your your first two guys off the bench are huge. They gotta be good. Yeah. That's very meaningful to your playoff success. That's why, <laughs> Many feel like Denver may be more vulnerable because they lost a couple guys this offseason. That's why we don't want to play campaign again ever in the playoffs. Um, Speaking of maybe opponents, we might not ever want to play again in the playoffs. Last episode, we talked about how the Clips might fall to six, which doesn't, you know, seem super crazy. But now the Mavericks are starting to creep up to five. They're looking good. They're looking uh, they're good, fellas. Looking very good. 
Where are we at on feeling? So the Clippers have eliminated the Mavs each time we've played them in a series. It is not always the prettiest. It is not always the easiest, but they win the series. Um, where are we at on maybe Mavs clips round three? Are you guys, I'm, I mean, I guess I'm ready in the long run, but those series are always terrifying. It's one, it's one of the few teams that can't use a size advantage against the Clippers. Adam, how are you feeling about this matchup? You seem high. It's it's scary. Uh, but so is Zion. I was watching yeah. that Pels Bucks game on NBA TV the other night and just watching how inept Giannis and Brooke Lopez were <laughs> with trying to contain Zion Williamson. And I'm thinking about the Clippers trying to slow him down. He's just he's an unsolvable problem type of player. And I don't know what you're doing against him. I don't know what you're doing against Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving now together. Uh, so they're one game back of the Pelicans, and they're in the same division. This is why divisions matter, and whoever Hell wins, it, yeah, <laughs> whoever wins that Southwest, you know, will likely be uh, the four, or the five seed. So it's it's concerning, especially they just won what back to back games in Sacramento. Luca last night was pointing at Vladi Divac, former front office uh, president of the Kings, saying, You should have drafted me at the end of that game last night. Hey, Luca. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fair. They drafted him in Bagley. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's a grist. He's not wrong. <laughs> um, I don't want to see this Mavs mistakes team with were Luka. made, okay, man? <laughs> L- Luca strikes enough fear in you in late game situations. Him and Kyrie, yeah. after the left handed push shot he just made over Nikola Jokic to win that crazy game. I mean, Kyrie's one of the most clutch players of all time. And they're peaking at the right time, too. We were talking about the Clips maybe peaking at the right time. The Mavs have been on they a are, longer run. They out. are rolling lately. Yeah. Yeah. And um, sadly, their schedule much easier than the Pelicans. They have the 21st toughest schedule remaining. The Pelicans is 10th. Phoenix still has the toughest, and they've been reeling a little bit. Sacramento's at the fifth toughest. So Pelicans Dallas maybe the driver's the, seat. Trailing the Celtics right now, too, with about 10 minutes left in the third. Now you're in this unenviable position where you're like, I want the Celt- I want the U.S. Pelicans to lose. But wait, do I? I want them to stay ahead of the <laughs> Dallas Mavericks. Like, You're not going to be able to manipulate any of these standings at the end of the season. No team is going to be able to be like, I choose this matchup. <laughs> Things are just too tight right now. It's too close. Yeah. Um yeah, that's a good call. We and it's going to change. So every you're right, everything starts. It's going to change up until the last day of the season. They're not going to know their playoff opponent. Yeah, probably until the last day of the season. The last day, there there could be some shenanigans going on, but True. before yeah. that, <laughs> there's not a clear picture at all. I wonder. What time all you can through? do is control you, though. You know, like as long as they as long as they hold down four, you know, at at least maintain home court for one for for one round of the playoffs. Uh, that, I mean, that's all you can really do. You know, you, 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 you can't control the standings outside of that. We've seen them flip flop before, uh, you know, get a, maybe a little cheeky with some end of season stuff. They don't have that opportunity now. The it's, you know, game. it's, it's the, just not, it's not going to happen. So the good news, if you play Dallas, they have what could be a fatal flaw, which is their defense, just like the Sacramento Kings where they've been bottom 10 all season long. Now, yeah. The Clippers have been really bad since the Grammy road trip defensively. So I'm sure they're licking their chops, seeing their offense against this Clippers defense. But we know, and the last two games have proven it, that the Clippers do have the potential to play like a top 10 defense on any given night because of personnel. They do. Um, I just checked to see when the Clippers play to end the season. Uh, the last game of the Clippers season, and this is so fitting, is a 12-30 game at home against the Rockets um, who are playing very good. So that's going to be interesting. That's part of a five and seven. Um, That, that is interesting because the Rockets, what they are right there with the golden state warriors. Yeah. They're trying to get in the play in now. Jalen green is like elite. (laughs) He's like, he's like figured it out. Um, uh, Coming up, we're going to be talking. There was a lot of Paul George contract talk this last week or so, and we haven't really talked about it, so we're going to talk about it. If you're listening, 
Uh, there's going to be some ads that might be loud. Those are coming up. Uh, after these loud ads, we're talking Paul George contracts in three, two, one. Welcome back in. It's Clips and Dip, episode 64 of season two. I'm Adam Oslin. We got Chuck Mockler and Will Updike. It is Eclipse and Dip live. If you missed it, you're listening to this in podcast form as we make sure to put it up that way too. Uh, previewed a little bit of the rest of the Clippers season with nine games remaining. Talked about what needs to be done against Charlotte, one of the worst teams in the league, which is pretty much just play your brand of basketball, get off to a quick start. But there are some off-the-court topics as we look ahead because Paul George, up to this point, has not gotten that contract extension. It's been an up-and-down season for him. I think it's fair to say at this point. Things are uh, trending back upward, which is great. He's been very good. I know his shooting percentage was very bad up until the end of that game against Orlando, but coming into that one, he was shooting something like 54% from the field and 45% from three over his last 13 to 15 ball games. So he had been looking much better, more spry, more bounce, more pop, just looking like Paul George again. I know he missed a dunk. I know he tried to dunk on someone, and he missed that <laughs> dunk again, and he has missed a few of them this season. But I like the confidence in his body to know that he can take a play like that or try to uh, at least attempt that highlight. So the contract situation, there was a rumor out there regarding the Philadelphia 76ers, Chuck, and some people, some reporting uh, on it. Yeah, it was called the worst-kept secret that the 76ers really want Paul George. The prevailing idea is that because and this was Keith like, Pompey, right? Like yeah, the, the, the this Sixers is from, guy. Yeah, the Sixers guy. Um, the The idea is that they would offer him a max because you don't have to give Maxi all this money yet. Uh, all anyway, the way that it works out is they could give Paul George a full max. Which they is, have an insane amount of cap room coming up. This, yeah, like they they will be, I think, one of the top five or top three teams in terms of available cap space. Yeah, so it's like if you can get. Paul George to pair up with Joel Embiid, get a healthy run. It's not a, a crazy idea for them to offer Paul George the max, but there's a lot of like stuff that needs to happen for that to happen. Like Paul George has a $49 million player option that he would opt out of and then sign this contract with the 76ers. But the Clipper, I think the Clippers are just going to sign uh, Paul George because Eric Pink has put out an article that, if the Clippers, the way that everything's structured is if the Clippers don't sign Paul George, they can't replace him with someone who makes as much money as him. We've been telling people this for yeah. a while. Like, they're tied to these guys. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you guys think that Philly somehow figures out how to offer him a max without tampering, which seems difficult? <laughs> um, but if four for, what is it, four to 12? 212 mil for the max for PG. I so much is still yet to be determined in this playoff run. I think that would ultimately say what his value could be. Now it seems like with what Kawhi took Paul George should be willing, not willing, but a lot of people just understood that as, Oh, so he's going to get a little bit less mm -hmm. than Kawhi Leonard. And that's how these guys are going to come back. Because remember, post game, after Kawhi signed the contract, he was asked about it and he said, Yeah, well, pretty much everybody's coming back. So it, it felt like a foregone conclusion then. But then Paul George has a couple of months of some really down play with his percentages, doesn't look like the same guy, seemed to be tied to the fact that he had a left knee injury going on, a left groin injury. And now it seems like that's proven by the fact with how good he's looked over the last three weeks. But I, I, I just, it's hard to go that far down the road right now with PG <laughs> and what could happen when his legacy uh, could be somewhat defined by this upcoming playoff run. It's a big uh -huh. one for everybody on this Clippers team, including Paul George. And I think it's why both teams are sticking to their guns, to be perfectly honest with you. Like I, I, I know that Paul George w wants the max, or at least that's everything. Of course, that, he wants that, the max. That, that, yeah. we've, that we've seen. Um, you know, I don't think they've said it in so many words. Like we'll see what happens when the playoffs playoffs come around. But I do think that there's probably an understanding that for that to be on the table, um, we're gonna have to see. 
you know some big shit has to happen yeah it's yeah it's the flacco contract right it's like dude get a, get us there and make things happen and then we'll give you a big old contract um yeah i think and i think i i think also at the end of the day i think bomber's going to the the new salary cap stuff makes it difficult cuz it is effectively kind of a hard cap it screws your the it's, apron it's, stuff i mean it's completely a, it's yeah it's completely a hard cap um we have a couple people asking in the chat about playing two centers at one time sorry for the hard pivot no, well, I was two different say, people. <laughs> it should be addressed <laughs> <laughs> quickly. Uh, Saif Naif. Don't says, we do this every year? <laughs> yeah, every single year we've done this. Saif, my guy. They have a center who might be the best shooting big men in all time to- of all time next to Rudy Gobert in Cat. And one of the best There's a huge of all time difference. In Rudy Gobert. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a playing Plumley. And if Issa Zubas does not give you a shooter. Tyson Zoo. Uh, Tyson Zoo is something that. I've wondered about that. P.J. Tucker's out of the lineup, it seems like. P.J. Tucker got his three minutes against Philadelphia. And Ty Lue was like, I guess we're done with this. I don't um, think he's out. I know. wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't rule him out. Ugh, I wish you. I oh, know he's going to play playoff minutes. There's going to be. Somebody Tucker brought this up. Minutes. I don't know if it was Robert Flom. I'm going to say it was somebody on two on three hoops because I can't remember who, and that's who uh, we are affiliated with. <laughs> somebody brought up the fact that the reason they've been trying P.J. Tucker next to Avica Zubats is to get ready for a matchup against Jokic. Because mm. I brought this up before, but the best way to play Jokic, the Lakers kind of uncovered this last season, is to put a smaller defender in front of him and have a big man that can roam behind him. Shade, yeah. And Philly did some of that last year with P.J. Tucker and Joel Embiid. And P.J. was pretty effective against Jokic, considering it's relative to you know playing against the greatest player <laughs> in the last few years and it's likely going to be the MVP once again. It gave him some small issues. And maybe that's the reason they've been trying PJ next to Avica Zubas to prepare those two guys to play next to one another in case they take on the Denver Nuggets. I wonder if we'll see it when they match up in a couple of games. Probably not would be my guess because Ty Lue doesn't seem like he'd be like, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> um, but that is a good point. Um, yeah, uh, the, the double center talk clouded my brain. Um, do we have anything else? That we want, how I'm feeling pretty good. Um, Clippers take on the Hornets tomorrow. We got to imagine that'll be a win. I'm assuming we haven't picked, however, I think we can close this episode out. Who is our Kawhi Leonard player of the game picks for Clippers versus Hornets? Adam, mm. I will go with give me a mere coffee. Oh, give me yeah, a mere coffee in that yeah. game. If we're you don't want to assume anything, but if the Clippers can put themselves in a position to put a team away early. Maybe Amir Coffee gets extended run out there. We've seen him also during closing time, like against the Philadelphia 76ers, where he was great out there with that pass to Kawhi cutting to the basket, by the way. Amir's trending upward as well at the right time after some down shooting uh, after his really hot start when he got back into the rotation. It's a good call. Will, your Kawhi Leonard player of the game pick. I'm going Norm. Yeah, I I think that uh, I I think that he can be a big part of sort of piling on this team. Uh, you know, extending leads with that second unit is gonna is gonna prolong uh, some rest time for Kawhi and PG and even Harden. And hopefully, we get one of those fourth quarters where you know they 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 barely have to touch the floor. Mm, yeah, I think I'm going with Russ because if there's one. There's a couple guys who we obviously want to be trending upwards towards the playoffs. Russ has got to be one of them because he's going to get some playoff time. Um, so I hope he has a good game and I hope he can make things happen. He might get some extended run too, right? He's a candidate for a few more minutes if things go well in this game. Yeah. Um, so that would be that would be nice to see. Um, I think we're going to have a double dip for that. Adam, do you want to tell the YouTube audience what the double dip is? 
And that is when one of these two guys comes on with me on Clippers Talk, which is the official post-game show for your Los Angeles Clippers, where we take phone calls after the ball game and have guests on, like these two fun gentlemen. One of them will be on with me. We also post that then later on. We uh, extract that part <laughs> from Clippers Talk and uh, put it on the Clips and Dip podcast. You can listen to it there, too. Absolutely. Um, oh, Will, do you want to answer this? Or wait, Will, you do the positive thing uh, this episode because we got a great question from David Romo. Uh, yeah. W- Will David Romo says, have another moment? Yeah, like the 39-point game? The answer is yes. There's your positive thing. <laughs> we got it. Uh, Will, where can these fantastic people uh, listen to this pod and review it if they felt so inclined? Yeah, so, I mean, first off, if you didn't catch this live, you can do that over on YouTube.com slash at Clippers Podcast. you got to check us out over there. Please subscribe, like. Uh, you can leave a comment and really help us out. But you can listen to this anytime, wherever you get your podcast. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Deezer, Amazon Music. Anywhere you listen to podcasts, you can get this. If you listen over on uh, Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please leave a rating and review. Again, it helps us out. But uh, however you consume this, just just thanks for just thanks for checking us out. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. We'll talk to y'all tomorrow. And as always, let's go Clips.